which selections will be the biggest hits in the 1988 NFL Draft? Will there be anyone like the Juice in the late 60s? This number one pick became the number one man to reach the 2,000-yard plateau. O.J. Simpson dashed through the ice and snow for the Bills, darted past defenders, and had everybody in Buffalo dancing in the streets. Sometimes greatness comes from schools off the beaten path. And the Bears, by discovering Jackson State and a running back named Walter Payton, truly were blessed. There was nobody better than sweetness when it came time to dance to the music. Can the hits come in the 12th round? No question. The Raiders found linebacker Rod Martin there, and long before he was a Super Bowl hero, it was clear that he should have been taken higher. Maybe the choice will be a real hard rocker like Lawrence Taylor of the Giants, one of only two defensive players to be named MVP for a season. LT is more than tough enough. Atlanta is hoping fellow linebacker Andre Bruce is tough enough. We know he's the top choice, but who will follow on the 1988 hit parade? We're about to find out as the NFL Draft is underway. Looking live at the Marriott Marquis Hotel in New York City, where hopefully we will be live for the next seven hours. Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Berman, and welcome to the 53rd National Football League. They'll call it the selection meeting. We call it the draft. The crowd is ready. We're ready here at ESPN. It's the first time the draft has been on Sunday, and today it goes uh, for the first time in five years, I should say six years, the draft goes back to a two-day affair. They probably will go four or five rounds today. No round can start after 9 o'clock, but we'll be on with you till 7 o'clock Eastern time, and then they'll have the rest of the selections tomorrow. Now, as we get set, it should be a draft that will see many running backs, some outstanding wide receivers, and as we'll talk a little bit later on with our panel of experts, we could be seeing half of the first round consists of running backs and wide receivers, which should be interesting to you folks who follow college football because you've heard the names of these players for three or four years. The Lorenzo Whites, the Thurman Thomases, you know about these guys. The Tim Browns, the Michael Irvins, and so it will be not a quarterback draft, but a draft of many skill players. But at the top of the list, we're going to go defense. We already know about the first draft pick. He's Andre Bruce, linebacker from Auburn. He was selected by the Atlanta Falcons and already signed, sealed, delivered. He's yours. The second pick, well, as you know, earlier in the week, the Kansas City Chiefs made a deal with Detroit. They swap positions. The Chiefs went from three to two, and Detroit made out like a bandit because they only dropped one position to three overall, and they come up with Kansas City's second-round pick. But the Chiefs wanted to take the player that, uh, that they've been eyeing, and we anticipate that's Neil Smith. The but we now anticipate the commission. NFL selection meeting is now in session. First selection, the first round, Atlanta Falcons. Pause for dramatic effect. Atlanta selects Andre Bruce. Linebacker Auburn. And Next what a surprise, Kansas right? You City. never saw the, the Falcons even use the phone. How did they do that? Andre Bruce, he's a man at 6'5", 6'6", can fly like the wind. That outside linebacker weighs 235 pounds. Speed, perhaps, of a defensive back. Very strong player. The young man from Montgomery, Alabama, had eight sacks this last year as a senior. Three interceptions, one which he returned for a touchdown. He is a guy that they hope can be an impact player along the lines of Lawrence Taylor. The way it goes these days when you, most of the teams play a 3-4 defense, the big sacks come from the outside linebackers, and that is what Atlanta would hope Andre Bruce can bring them for about the next 10 years. He also can run, as you can see, returning the INT for a touchdown. And so the Atlanta Falcons have picked a guy that we have rated on the top of our board, and they had rated on the top of theirs. He added up. We rate four different categories depending on the player, and you'll be getting familiar with these as the day goes on. A possible, uh, the top possible grade would be a 20, and it would be 19-2 for Andre Bruce. And so now as we move to, uh, to my immediate left, Tom Jackson, and to my far left, Paul Zimmerman, our own good doctor, Dr. Z, 
Can Andre Bruce be an impact player, Paul? Well, I tell you what, we'll Kansas answer that City question Chiefs. shortly. Here's the commissioner. Whoops. Kansas City selects on the first round Deal Smith, defensive end, Nebraska. All right, so Neil Next Smith, as expected, lines. goes uh, to the Kansas City Chiefs. That's what they made the deal for. Now let's go back first to Andre Bruce. Can he be an intimidator? I don't see him as a Lawrence Taylor or Cornelius Bennett. Those guys, you saw them in college, the motor was going all the time. This guy takes one play off every now and then. He's, he's, he doesn't have the consistency. I'm, of course, I'm the only one that has questions about him. Everybody else loves him. Mr. Outside Linebacker. What do you think of Bruce? Well, I, I think that that incon inconsistency that Z alludes to, uh, you know, taking a playoff every now and then, I think that that can be conditioned. I think when you get to the pro level and you're, you're making the, the million-dollar salary plus, I think that he will tend to get consistent. Uh, Camp will do that for him. What I would worry about is a guy like this going to a team that is not going to, he's not going to make the Atlanta Falcons a good football team. And so I think what he's got to do is guard against getting lackadaisical uh, over those first couple of years when he's going to have to struggle with a team that's going to struggle. Well, this is the first draft for uh, Ken Herrock, who now calls the shots as far as uh, player personnel goes down with the Atlanta Falcons. And last year, uh, what were some of the many problems with the Atlanta Falcons? Yeah, they had the worst record in football. 17 quarterback sacks last season. Uh, you should have that in a month uh, if you're a good NFL team. And so... Now we have Andre Bruce going to the Falcons. Falcons need a, a player just about everywhere, and they feel that they might as well start with Bruce. Look for Atlanta to try and uh, make a deal to get up in the last third, or maybe the last half uh, of this opening round. They, they certainly would like uh, one of those top five receivers. They'll take number five if they, uh, if they can get up to maybe about 16 or 17. Let's move on to Neil Smith, fellas, because uh, here's a guy that comes from Nebraska Zim that can play really all four positions on the line, although the Chiefs probably look at him outside, right? Well, I talked to the Chiefs about him. Uh, he's a good sacker. He's a slender guy, runs a 4.58, um, and I, I can see him as an open side pass rusher, but they're looking to replace Art Still, who plays the power side, the left side, and I said, can he play, you know, is he sturdy enough to play there? And they said, oh, yeah, we think he can, you know, put on a little weight and, and fill in, so he's the answer to what they want. So Neil Smith, Tommy, goes uh, a division that you know full well, the uh, the AFC West. Uh, the Chiefs did have some great players there and, and still in Bell, but they're not uh, what they once were. Neil Smith, the man has a huge wingspan. I met him last night for the first time, and it made me know why I retired from football. <laughs> <laughs> He, uh, 65 tackles last year, seven and a half sacks for Nebraska. And remember, not everybody in the Big 8 spends their life passing all the time. They list him at 6'4", 257. Uh, was a defensive tackle there, but as we say, he can play anywhere along the line. Probably will be used on the outside because Bill Moss, who was the last player that they selected in the first round, defensive player back in 84, uh, the Pro Bowl nose tackle, certainly anchors that right there. So as he grades out, we total up the same thing as uh, Andre Bruce, 19.2, quickness a 5-0. And a guy that size, that quick, is that scary. Great lateral movement reminds me a lot of Art Still, that, that physical specimen that he is. And I think he's going to dominate on his side of the ball. A, a good, great choice for, for the uh, Kansas City Chiefs. We knew that Bruce would be one. Smith was a lock also. Now the fun begins as the Detroit Lions are up with the third overall pick next. The draft continues in a moment. I don't know whether to begin without him. I'm sure he's just sitting in that awful traffic. Steve, in his new 190 class Mercedes, sitting in traffic. Oh, sure, he's sitting there in line, drumming his fingers on the steering wheel, tapping his foot. Feeling with the radio stations, staring at the taillights of the car in front of him. Marie, I've commuted with Steve. What's that supposed to mean? Well, it means... <laughs> That's what it means. It's not just another credit card. It's the exciting new Citibank NFL Visa card that's different from any credit card you've ever carried or seen. It makes a statement that football is your sport and shows the world your favorite NFL team. Join the team. Call 1-800-NFL-VISA for a free tryout. The membership fee will be waived for the first six months. And get this, a 20% savings on authentic NFL Pro-Line gear that you charge to your card. It's the real thing, exactly what NFL players and coaches wear. And 
every time you use your card, you earn points you can redeem for free NFL Pro-Line gear. Plus, just by being a Citibank NFL Visa card member, you're automatically entered in our Super Bowl 23 sweepstakes. Enjoy all the exclusive privileges and the fun that goes along with this card. Get on the phone now. Call 1-800-NFL-VISA to apply and join the team. Oh, round of lights here. that outshines them all, ask for Bud Light. Please let me know when you're ready for another round. Because everything else is just a light. ESPN's coverage of the 1988 NFL Draft is brought to you by Mercedes-Benz, engineered like no other car in the world. By Bud Light, everything else is just a light. By AT&T, the right choice. And by the Hartford, the insurance people of ITT. Welcome back to New York and the 53rd NFL Draft. We're not the only fellas here that will be uh, watching the proceedings today. Let's go over to our guys who man the big board, Bob Lee and Mel Kuyper. Hi, right, Chris. There's a big board downtown at Wall Street. It plots and charts the fortunes of the economy. And Mel Kuyper's put together his big board of 40 top players. Uh, we're going to talk about Detroit, which right now has 850 to go to their selection. Picked up our first rumor of the day, though, Mel. Possibly the Rams looking to move up from their 14th spot go where the Giants are going out of the 10 hole and pick up Michael Irvin wide receiver it's reports a rumor we'll see if that eventuates Detroit well Detroit you know they made that great move moving down one spot picking up that second round choice uh, you know Benny Blades would fit in extremely well here as an impact defender uh, offensive coordinators have to change their game plan just with him being on the field so I think Benny Blades here would be an outstanding choice we've heard talk about the quality of the draft some people have talked it down some people may want to talk it down well, for job security, if you're a player personnel guy, if things don't pan out. Also, for economic reasons, because you've heard the story about Neil Smith, the difficulties he's having because the present-day value being put on his contract. You've been saying for years there are no bad, dra bad drafts, just bad drafters. Well, I really believe that. They're only talking basically about the first round when they talk about bad drafts. And uh, if you look back to 83, we had the six franchise quarterbacks. You put those six franchise quarterbacks in this draft, all of a sudden it goes to an outstanding year. But uh, I really believe the depth at certain positions, particularly when you look at, at the running back spot, you look at wide receiver, you look at that defensive backfield position, and even if you look at the offensive line, five, maybe six on round one. So I think overall it's a strong second to fifth round draft. And I think if you look, there's no glamour quarterbacks, there's no franchise receivers, but overall I think it's a very underrated draft. So you wouldn't say that as good as we have it in the wide receiver category, these wide receivers aren't going to make the same kind of impact that the quarterbacks class of 83 made. Those three receivers at the top, the Browns, the Sharps, the Irvins, can have the same impact that a Tuna Rice and a Brown had, and they can go back to the Chandler, uh, Jefferson, and Lofton days. This is an outstanding core of receivers. There's no question all three of these guys can have an immediate impact on the NFL, particularly Irvin because he yeah. comes from that ultimate pro-style attack at Miami. We're awaiting the third pick in the first round already. Uh, as predicted, Andre Bruce has the signed contract no drama there neil smith taken by kansas city detroit picking third in the draft they flip-flop with kansas city let's talk about the lions they've got less than seven minutes to make their selection jerry venici coming over from the chicago bears we were talking about this yesterday he may take the long term view of how to do this Daryl Rogers, the coach, he's got to win, he's got to win now. It's, uh, it's maybe a little surprising to some people he's going to be back to coach this team at the beginning of the 88 season because the Lions have not uh, played well. Well, they really haven't. And when you look at the Lions, they have a lot of needs. That's why Jerry, I think, was smart by moving down. When you talk about you know picking up that the second-round choice, which is almost like a first-round choice, a 29th player overall. They didn't lose anything. They moved down to that three spot. Now they can move down again if they want. If they want to take Blades, fine. Blades is like we talked about, yeah. an impact player that they probably could have considered with the second choice. But this is a, a situational type thing where Kansas City just happened to feel like the Raiders would trade up to get Smith. They knew that the Raiders were offering a second round pick as well. And uh, to move up, uh, you're talking about to move down one position and pick up the 29th player for a team like uh, Detroit, an outstanding move for Kansas City, a team that needs a lot of players. They're not two or three players away from reaching the playoffs and winning the uh, Super Bowl. They need bodies. They need to fill needs. And I think that's the reason that I question the trade that Kansas City made. A lot of the assessments we'll be doing historically of the team's so-called blue chip 
chip picks. Where teams pick in round one, round two, we'll call those the blue chip picks. 1980s in this decade, Detroit's had 14 selections in the first two rounds. They've drafted only one Pro Bowl player. That was Billy Sims. So they have come up empty in terms of Pro Bowl potential and Pro Bowl performance through this decade. And there might be a little bit of disagreement in that front office exactly where to go. No disagreement about where we're going with five minutes waiting on the Detroit selection. Let's get it back to Chris. All right, Robert, thank you. And so the Detroit Lions, Jerry Venisi, as you mentioned, the GM, would like the DB. The coach, Darrell Rogers, they have some seats to sell. Maybe would like a wide receiver. I have a feeling that uh, a gentleman who has joined us here now kind of likes when teams draft wide receivers uh, number one, at least when he was playing, and that's Joe Theismann, uh, late of the Redskins, current of, uh, of ESPN. Welcome aboard. Should Detroit do a draft a receiver, or do you got to go with the safety who can play there 10 years? I think because of the amount of receivers that are in the draft, Detroit has the luxury of waiting for the second round to make that pick. I really, like, I really feel like they have to go, although they have to sell seats, I think they have to go to Benny Blades. I really think they have to shore up that defensive secondary. Last game of the season, they start four free agents in the secondary. You're in the division with the Bears. You've got to figure out some way to stop people. I think they have to go defense. In this day and age, Joe, with a, a safety that can hit and cover uh, the style that Blades can, He's the only one, along with a Ricky Dixon, who's a corner, that, that stand head and shoulders up there. So I guess you can't let a guy like that pass. No, you really can't. You can't, you can't give up the athletic ability. This man is a great young football player, and he's made an imp he can be an impact player for them. They need some leadership. They need some young leadership on defense as well. As far as Jerry Venisi goes and Daryl Rogers, Daryl Rogers will make the pick. But believe me, we've seen what Venisi did with the Bears. It's going to be a lot of his input and research that's going to build that defense, and that's where they want to start. Do you sometimes devise a game plan totally away? Can you devise a game plan? Is Blades that good to say to a, let's say, offensive coordinator, gee, they have Blades back there, we got to go somewhere else? Is he that good? Not necessarily at the safety position. You can go away from corners. You can set your corners up and stay away from them. But safeties are always going to be somewhere in the play. A lot of times you want to take a safety, you can split a tight end out and say, like we tried to do in the Super Bowl, Super Bowl 18. Didn't work. <laughs> we tried to remove Mark uh, or um, their, their strong safety. Didn't matter. We couldn't do it. So it, it, you can't really devise a game plan to take safeties out. It's tough. Our best laid plans of mice and men, right, Zim? So Detroit, you knew they'd spend all 15 minutes for this pick. They're probably still figuring it out. Well, we, we have it blades all the way. Uh, as far as the selling seat stuff, I think the fans are smarter than people give them credit for. You don't sell seats on one guy making a, a fancy run back. You sell seats on, on victories, and fans understand that, especially in a good football town like Detroit. A player like Blades, Tommy, can he make linebackers better immediately? I think so. It puts a lot of pressure on people to do things, uh, as Joe said, outside toward the cornerbacks. Running a 4-3-40, I think Benny Blades is going to be the kind of guy that you will not be able to get away from. All right, the pick is coming up. Let's go up to the podium, and it, uh, here's the commissioner. He has it on the card. Detroit Lions. The Lions select in the first round. Benny Blaze, defensive back, Miami. And so we have defense. Tampa Bay Buccaneers. One, two, three. Bruce to the Falcons. Smith to the Kansas City Chiefs. Benny Blades goes to the Detroit Lions, so certainly the general manager won out. And in Benny Blades... Uh, Zim and, and Tommy, you're seeing a player that uh, a year ago led uh, the nation in interceptions uh, with 10 uh, as a junior. And Benny Blades at 6'1", 216, also was the fastest man on the Miami Hurricanes running under a 4'4", And it's not as if the Hurricanes don't have a lot of players that can fly. Well, and I think the interesting thing about Blades is that he's not content with knocking the ball down. He's the kind of kid who will go up for you, make the acrobatic catch. He doesn't mind laying out, dishing out some punishment. He's the kind of kid that's going to not only affect his position, but every other position in the defensive backfield. Five interceptions last year. Career interceptions, he had 19. And as you mentioned, Tommy, he can uh, he can certainly lay the old lumber. I hate to use the cliche, but enforce 5-0. That uh, kind of uh, backs up what we were thinking. Now, Tampa Bay with the fourth pick. Let's go to the point. Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay selects. Wisconsin tackle. Oh, oh good. Good. First up several. First, next, up first up Cincinnati. The first upset I figured, and you figured, I think, Dr. Z, that uh, the Buccaneers would give uh, Vinny Testaverde somebody to throw the ball to. We thought that their man would be Sterling Sharp, wide receiver from South Carolina. 
they go with the top-rated offensive lineman in the draft where you got to protect the quarterback, too. Let's face it, Paul Gruber, uh, tackle from Wisconsin, certainly not a bad pick, but guys thought that... Uh, that perhaps that uh, Vinny wanted someone to throw to him. Yeah, he we thought does. that because he told us that. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, let me make that note on my watch. 12-21. It's the a 21 lie. minutes. That's right. right. <laughs> the first lie of the year. And so, uh, Paul Gruber, uh, top lineman, goes to Tampa Bay. They hope he plays the old bookend tackle theory for wow. the 10 years. And so now, you're seeing the receivers slide down a bit. Now, yeah, the Bengals, of course, have made a... a well, we'll talk about Gruber first. He's a guy that got better every year at Wisconsin. Still was improving as a senior. Definitely the top-rated lineman. Oh, Reason? Well, I'd, I'd say the, the Bucks picked up 100 pounds on that pick by not taking the wide receiver. <laughs> and in American money, you know, that's uh, almost 200. That's right. And so now, they, I mean, the Bucks need a lot of things. Ray Perkins does down there. You draft an offensive tackle. Um, it's a good move, Tommy. Yeah, I, I, I think so. I think that good football teams Perkins are built on the front line. Sorry. And I think that's what Perkins knows. And a quarterback may want a wide receiver. I'm sure Joe liked to see a wide receiver drafted, but you also like to see protection up in front. I'll tell you, as a wide receiver, you'd rather have a left tackle because if the left tackle doesn't block the defensive ends and the linebackers, you're never going to get the ball down the field to a receiver. So I think from a, if I'm Vinny Testaverde, I'm delighted because that way I'm going to have a few more seconds. If my receiver isn't quite as fast, that's quite all right. I'm going to have a little more time to get the ball off to him. So I think it's, if I'm a quarterback, I'm delighted with this pick. So Paul Gruber goes to the Buccaneers. Let's go to Bobby and Mel. All right, we're talking about the importance of that selection. When you look across the line, especially if you're playing left tackle in that division, in Tampa's division, is some of the right offensive ends, the defensive ends, you've got to face. You do. you got to go up against Dolman. you got to go up against Dent twice yeah. each year. And when you're talking about Vinny Testaverde, you're talking about a franchise quarterback, keeping him healthy, allowing him to hit the young receivers, Carrier and Hill. So when you're talking about uh, a Gruber, you put him over that left tackle spot, you keep that blindside pressure off of Testaverde. And like I say, facing Denton Dolman twice each year, I'm sure that had a lot to do with Perkins' decision. We're waiting on Cincinnati's selection. It'll be the fifth one in the first round. They've got about 12 and a half minutes to go, then to be followed by the Raiders. And we'll see what we've been hearing about the Raiders. Are they going to package the number six overall selection and the number nine, possibly to the skins for Jay Schrader? It's been the hot rumor of the weekend. Our draft coverage continues from New York City right after this. can't beat the South Jersey locations or the facilities, but Center City and Atlantic City are real close by. Actually, I'm just staying here a short time at a Corman suite, but if I'm ever transferred up here permanently, I get a Corman apartment. My wife would flip. Corman suite accommodations compared to a hotel? It's no contest. I have a great apartment that I'm very proud of, and it's probably in the best spot in New Jersey. I'd say Corman really worked for me. Miller Ford is out to break all sales records. We have the area's largest selection of new and used Ford cars, trucks, and vans ready to roll. If you're planning to buy a new car or truck this week, visit Miller Ford. A brand new 1988 F-150 XLT Lariat loaded with air conditioning, cruise control, tilt wheel, and sliding rear window. Now, for a limited time, take advantage of Ford's $500 factory rebate and buy all this truck for only $9,999. So what do you say? Miller Ford. Miller Ford, Route 38 in Mount Holly. Serious. Battle lines are drawn for the NHL's Cold War. ESPN presents the Stanley Cup Playoffs. All live, all the way to the championship finals as teams take their shots at the defending champion Edmonton Oilers. The showdown heats up. The Stanley Cup Playoffs right here on ESPN. The ballroom of the Marriott Marquis in New York City for the ninth consecutive year. ESPN's live and continuous coverage of the National Football League draft. We continue from the big board set along with Mel Kuyper. I'm Bob Lee. We're waiting to see what Cincinnati does. Ten and a half minutes now remaining. Each team with 15 minutes to make that first round selection. Cincinnati. In the 80s, with their early picks, they've had a great emphasis on defense. We've had, what, the first three selections here have been defensive selections. We haven't seen a vaunted wide receiver taken. 
Will the Bengals take the first wide receiver? I think, Roy, I think right now you're getting to the point where Timmy Brown is becoming the best player available, and it's going to be interesting to see who passes up a need factor to go with, uh, I'd say, you're looking at the Cincinnati Bengals, the defensive back position. And of course, a Ricky Dixon from Oklahoma is sitting there. Even though, though he's a slight projection moving from free safety to corner, he would definitely fill that need for the Bengals. Evidently, at the combine workout, all three Browns, Paul Brown, Mike Brown, and Pete Brown, were very, really looking specifically at running backs. Brad Muster's name came up. Hasn't been working out for a lot of clubs lately. Of course, he had that ankle injury during the year. But I think a running back, considered, considering the fact that, uh, you know, James Brooks, tough to keep him healthy for 16 games. Kenneth Brew, you know, has had that uh, weight fluctuate back and forth and has been an underachiever. I think you look at that running back position, that cornerback spot, that may supersede that wide receiver, Timmy Brown, being the best, best athlete on the board at this point. We're waiting to see what happens if we go five selections deep without having a wide receiver. One of the teams that really has improved, Philadelphia. That's our next destination. Pete Axtell, good morning. Good afternoon. Good morning, Bob. Uh, one thought that occurred to me, a lot of people may wonder, why did Kansas City trade up, give up a second-round draft choice just to move from third to second choice? Well, the reason is some people cast great shadows over every draft. Some people around this league just uh, have an impact even when they're not doing anything. What happened was when Al Davis traded Sean Jones for the number nine draft pick, there were rumors that he was then going to trade up with Detroit, get the second pick, and take Neil Smith out from under Kansas City. Kansas City, anything but let the Raiders get a player that they wanted. They traded up, made quite a sacrifice. Now the next shadow comes up. Just talking to Buddy Ryan a few, a few minutes ago, he was saying if, if uh, Bobby Beathard makes the deal and trades Schrader for the Raiders' sixth and ninth pick uh, uh, in the first round, uh, uh, that's terrifying to the rest of the Eastern Division. Uh, suddenly, uh, Beathard, who's used to dealing with uh, no ammunition in first rounds, would have a lot of ammunition and probably end up with Keith Jackson. Back to you, Bob. All right, you look so good sitting at Buddy Ryan's desk with the picture of one of his many horses there behind you with the vet in Philadelphia. Uh, rumors flying about the Schrader trade, and some people saying, is he a quarterback to trade? Uh, younger? I'll tell you, Rippian's, uh, Mark Rippon's the key to the whole deal. You know, of course, Doug Williams coming off that knee injury. He only had that one big game, the Super Bowl. So I think Mark Rippon is the key to this whole deal if, in fact, Schrader is traded. You also hear Montana's name come up. We even heard a wild rumor about McMahon. Yes. You know, you, everybody uh, seems to think that the Raiders will trade those two choices rather than keep those two selections. It's hard to say right now because it's a supply and demand with quarterbacks, Bob. you got to give up an awful lot to get a quarterback like this and whether the Raiders want to do that is to be seen right now but uh, definitely the rumors are flying about those three quarterbacks. We picked up a report just before we went on the air that the LA Rams who have a lot of selections coming of course because of the Dickerson trade in the 14 hole might be trying to move up to 10 and trade off with the Giants and pick up Michael Irvin and Howard Balzer one of our regulars every year has been with us situated at Rams headquarters and let's check in with Howard. Okay, Bob, uh, here we are in Anaheim, a glorious day. We finally got some good weather out here. No rainouts in sight for any of the baseball teams. Obviously, the Rams, the big story of the morning here at Rams Park. A lot of rumors surrounding them trying to trade up with their two picks in the first round. Plus, of course, they have three second-round picks also. Michael Irvin has been a name that's mentioned. Don't count out Tim Brown. Remember, the Rams looking for a kick returner now that Ron Brown has announced his retirement to pursue a track career. Other talk with San Diego. The Chargers don't have a second-round pick. Uh, that went to the Rams in the Barry Redden deal last year. The Chargers and the Rams apparently talking again. Tight end Pete Holohan might be involved. Also, running back Gary Anderson. So uh, the Rams trying to make a lot of moves to get up. Uh, Craig Hayward might not be in their plans. Apparently the organization has perhaps counted him out. Gaston Green might be a possibility for the Rams further down in that first round, Bob. A lot of rumors flying about possibility to trade up. One other possibility. Uh, Philadelphia, Miami, well, maybe Miami, making a move. Miami and Philadelphia evidently both have a keen interest in Keith Jackson, tight end from Oklahoma. You have Green Bay sitting there with that seventh choice. Lindy and Fani going back to when he was the offensive coordinator at Tulane. Had Rodney Holman. Moves to Cincinnati. Had Dan Ross over to Cleveland with Ozzie Newsom. Tight end's a key position for Infani. And if you look at, at those two clubs, Miami and Philadelphia, the kind of impact that Keith Jackson could have with a Marino, with a Randall Cunningham, those two clubs may be jockeying for position in, in an attempt to, to garner the Oklahoma tight end. And you have to wonder if the Rams have been talking about trading up with the Giants to get Michael Irvin, whether they have to make that trade now. Four selections deep, and uh, no wide receiver has been put up on the big board. Chris? All right, Bobby, uh, just after seeing Howard Balzer and also uh, Mel 
We're going to vote at the end of the seven hours best hair in the league. <laughs> Mel or Howard Balzer. Uh, Bengals, uh, what have they been doing? Of course, they spent their career in the 80s drafting uh, wide receivers. Do they go with another one? Paul Brown, in print, not that long ago said, I really would like to sign Tim Brown. Tim Brown's going to ask for a lot of dollars. You have to wonder, do they go again? This is the 20 selections in the first two rounds. Uh, they've gotten 11 starters out of that, which is pretty good, but you, they draft a lot of wide receivers over the years. Of course, they had McGee and Eddie Brown, and then in 81, they went Burser Collinsworth, one and two. I can't see the Bengals going receiver. Dr. Z, I would have to think that uh, Ricky Dixon, right? That's who you were talking about, because there's a fall-off after Blades and Dixon, and third defensive back is quite a way lower, correct? Well, they're, they're, uh, early in the week, their projected order was Blades number one, Dixon number two, and then uh, a dogfight among the wide receivers. Uh, Muster is a name that's been mentioned a lot. They, they like him. In fact, Pete Brown, called their personnel manager, called him a Jack Armstrong type. They like him very much, but I think they like Dixon better. Well, we shall know because the pick is now at the podium, and let's check in with the commissioner. Checking the name, of course. Cincinnati Bengals, pick on the first round, defensive back, Oklahoma, Ricky Dixon. Los Angeles Raiders are up. And so the Bengals go with Ricky Dixon, and we have four defensive players and an offensive lineman uh, chosen in the first five. And now I think we come to wide receivers and running backs. So Dixon, who played safety at college, going to play corner in the pros, uh, goes to the Cincinnati Bengals. Quickly, let's bring in Bino Cook, who, of course, has been on the Tim Brown watch personally through his career at Notre Dame. Uh, you don't want to call him a plummeter here, but here's the Heisman Trophy winner. How far could he slide down, and does he surprise you? Well, whoever gets him still is going to get a great player, and he's also a kid who absolutely caused no problems. He's a class individual. He's going to be able to hunt returns, kick off returns. He will be in the, the Pro Bowl within three seasons. Maybe, if the Raiders don't do anything, Al Davis has enjoyed Heisman Trophy winners in the past. He does have some wide receivers. Would Tim Brown look good in Raider colors? Well, he looked good in any colors. That's the way I look at him. I mean, he's going to be a great player. I, you know, they want defensive facts, but uh, Tim Brown, when he plays, again, he will be an outstanding player in the NFL. There's no doubt. He would go within the next couple players. We'll get back you know, uh, to Tim Brown shortly. Let's take a look at the figures on Ricky Dixon, who, as we mentioned, was a safety for Oklahoma, but uh, projects to a, a cornerback in the pros. 5'11", 177 pounds, an excellent one-on-one -on -one defender. A fearless tackler who also has the great speed, which, of course, you need to play the corner. He shared with Benny Blades the Jim Thorpe Award last year as the uh, outstanding defensive back in college football. Eight interceptions for 214 yards in returns last year with one touchdown. And uh, Ricky Dixon uh, goes to those Bengal stripes where they certainly can use some help uh, at the defensive back position. And so uh, his, uh, he goes out of the Big 8 to the Cincinnati Bengals in a division where uh, the Bengals feel that even though they have the real poor record, they don't need that much to change their fortunes into an above 500 team and uh, into a team that can contend for the AFC Central crown. Now his ratings, you see the quickness and the agility are the best. And they add up to a 19-0. So Ricky Dixon uh, on our board is number nine as Mel rates him. And so the Cincinnati Bengals, realizing that Blades and Dixon, a class uh, uh, of their own, had to go defensive back. Good move, I mean, yeah. I think so. Think, I think if you need a corner, he's a good one. Uh, he received a lot of one-on-one -on -one coverage uh, when he was uh, at Oklahoma, and I think that that's going to help him make the adjustments in the corner. You mentioned his main attributes, quickness and agility, and you can't look for anything better in corner. Quickness and agility and that ability to go up and get the football, and Ricky's got all of that. No question that the Bengals need some help defensively. I mean, they even though they didn't... Uh, show much of the one loss record their offensive stats if you just look at stats of course there are lies darn lies in statistics some people say but uh, the Bengals have been looking for defensive help in a long time and they got uh, Dixon in the first round we'll be back with the next pick because the fun is just beginning the Raiders who own the next pick the sixth overall and the ninth overall are up next and we'll be back to New York in a moment get real really real
your Proline catalog, send $1 to 10812 Alder Circle, Dallas, Texas, 75238. That's 10812 Alder Circle, Dallas, Texas. Let's go. We are back at the Marriott Marquis Hotel in New York. Chris Berman and a cast of thousands as uh, we continue our live coverage of the 53rd NFL Draft. A couple of notes. When the Buccaneers selected uh, Paul Gruber from Wisconsin, uh, they also, back in 1980, took an offensive lineman from Wisconsin, Ray Schnell, in the first round. Never quite turned out to be the player that they obviously hope uh, that Gruber will be. And a note on Benny Blades. If you're thinking, gee, I, I wonder how long ago a defensive back went that high. I can't remember. Uh, you're not suffering from Alzheimer's because uh, you have to go back to 1963 when the Cardinals picked Jerry Stovall that high or higher with the second overall pick. So that tells you what kind of class Benny Blades is in. Now, the rumors flying about Jay Schrader maybe getting traded from the Redskins to the Raiders now that the Raiders moved up and had the sixth and the ninth overall pick. Our Pete Axtum visited with uh, Bobby Bethard, GM of the Redskins, and he talked about the possibility. One hot topic in the league, are you going to trade Jay Schrader? Uh, I, I really think it's highly unlikely that there'll be any deal for Jay Schrader. We uh, <clears throat> had an inquiry from a team earlier uh, this spring, and uh, we, we listened. There, there had been no offer made for Jay Schrader, and the only thing, our, our thought was that if people are going to make these inquiries, uh, we have to listen. I think you have to listen uh, when any team calls about a trade. Uh, if it's something that could help the Redskins, then possibly we'd consider that. But we'd love to go to training camp just the way we are because uh, uh, Doug Williams did a great job and Jay Schrader's a young quarterback. I think he has a great future. So it would be very, very unlikely that we would make a trade for a quarterback. The Raiders with the next selection. There they are on the special helmet phone. And uh, Zim That's Al Davis's brother, Jerry. Yeah. No, really. Is it? Yeah, the guy in the white jacket is Al's brother. Well, are they talking about uh, a trade? No. Well, I talked no. to him before. He said no trade. And I said Tim Brown was the guy that I thought they'd pick. And he said no, they don't need a receiver. They seem to think that Mervyn Fernandez would play. They're the only ones that do. Um, they said defensive back if available or offensive lineman. I still think Tim Brown. What about their quarterback situation? I mean, it's almost impossible to trade for a QB, but they, they got to go with Wilson. We talked last night. Shanahan likes Wilson a little bit, the new coach? Well, I, I think that if he's there and he's the only guy you, you have, you have to like him. <laughs> but, but I think if they, certainly if they get a chance to pick up a, a good quarterback, a guy that they think can help this football team. Although I will say this too, when Bo Jackson is in running, when he, when he puts down his baseball glove and he comes and he runs, he makes Mark Wilson a better quarterback. Maybe that's what Shanahan's depending on. I just heard a rumor that uh, the Raiders are trying to trade for Joe Theismann. Anything to that, Joe? No, as a matter of fact, I just made the phone call. It wasn't, no, I heard the rumor myself. Uh, <laughs> now, that's your well, kind of team. I wrote something down to Pete, and I was going to hand it to him, say, uh, would you consider it? I, I actually tried to go to the Raiders when I was unable, when I was unable to play with the Redskins anymore, and I asked if he was interested. He said, excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> so that took care of that. I think, I don't, I really believe the Raiders uh, will either, they'll either trade, I don't think they're going to trade for a quarterback. A lot of time when a new coach takes over, He's willing to give that other quarterback a good look. And this is where I think it'll happen here with the Raiders. You don't have the same, um, oh my gosh, what am I going to do with this guy syndrome. You've got a new coach. He says, okay, maybe a new system, maybe a new life will change this guy's outlook. I think that's what they have with Wilson. Plus, you have to remember, Al Davis's ego is involved. He drafted Wilson. I don't think he's going to give up, give up on him right now. He's going to try and surround him with some support. And Tommy brought up a great point. When they get Bo Jackson there, it makes everybody better. The trouble is you don't want to be 0-7 or 0-8 by the time you get Bo into uniform. That, yeah, that is a concern as the Raiders have never drafted this high, sixth overall. And, of course, they pick up by the ninth pick in the deal involving Sean Jones. I do know this, that they were talking to the Chargers and uh, Steve Ortmeyer, who used to be with the Raiders, perhaps packaging receiver Doki Williams and Mark Wilson for a Chargers number one. They also talked to the Chargers maybe about just Wilson going down there. The Chargers already got Malone. They're going to get Wilson to him. I mean, they're collecting. At any rate, uh, I'll stop that sentence right there. Uh, but that was a rumor and that they were indeed on the phone uh, with uh, San Diego, but no trade to that effect. As we wait, think about the guys that are waiting for that phone call to find out when they're drafted. It could take an hour, could take five hours. Our Andrea Joyce is in Stillwater, Oklahoma, with a running back who could be a first-rounder, Thurman Thomas. Hello, Andrea. 
Hello, Chris. We all know that the NFL team officials need piles and piles of statistics to get through this day. Players, on the other hand, have a couple of other needs. Patience and maybe enough food to get them through what could be several hours of waiting. In Thurman Thomas's apartment, a typical college refrigerator, practically empty. But when you walk over to the stove, you see that something is definitely going on here. This is a special occasion. Probably more food here than Thurman has ever had in this apartment. Go on into the living room and the transformation of this apartment continues. Take a look at this. All of the furniture strategically placed around the one essential piece of equipment this afternoon, that of course being the television set. It is a little bit quiet in here right now. You see Thurman sitting there very pensively. All of the folks here, of course, expect, uh, expect everything to change by the end of the first round. They expect there to be some celebrating. Now back to New York and Chris Berman. And here go the Raiders. Raiders. Raiders select on the first round. Wide receiver, Notre Dame, yep. Jim Brown. Yep. Like we said, Next Al up, likes back. to collect Heisman Trophy winners. You had Marcus Allen, and we didn't mean to cut Andrea off so quickly because, you know, we're kind of getting hungry. It looks like there were some good things in the kitchen. Uh, Tim Brown, so he certainly doesn't plummet very far. Uh, and so the Raiders, they have their receivers. They have Lofton and Fernandez, but I guess the man can return kicks. He can return punts, and he's a, he's a heck of a player. I think when you have two first-round choices like, like they do, on your first one, you go for the exceptional athlete. You don't think of position. On your second one, now you can start thinking of filling a need like offensive line or something like that. But if you've got that exceptional talent, you got to grab them on that high pick. Offensive line, of course, they did uh, last year with Clay. They, they've done some high picks at the Raiders, so we shall see what they do. But obviously, we know now that the number six and the number nine overall pick uh, are not going to be involved in a trade. So Tim Brown, the Heisman Trophy winner, goes to the Los Angeles Raiders. And just thinking of, well, let's look at Tim Brown, and of course you know what he's done. People uh, questioned the, the last half of the college football season. They were kind of down on him, but I think down because, gee, should he win the Heisman Trophy? So we should qualify, how down are you on him? Now, he never did have the benefit of a classic drop-back quarterback. Pro-style quarterback. How many college wide receivers do? Not too many, of course, at, uh, at Miami, uh, they play in the pro set more. Yeah, well, that's one school. Well, I came up with one off the top of my head. Remember? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Brown University and Columbia, of course, also have those, but that's another story. Columbia has that. a classic uh, major. <laughs> <laughs> so Tim Brown returns the punts, returns the kicks, and uh, as we all remember, uh, the Monday night game in which the Rams came out of nowhere when Ron Brown was doing the returning, you can change a game right away with just kick and punt returning, and he rates to a 19-2, and quickness, you, you can't be any higher. You know, thinking about Thurman Thomas and also Tim Brown and all these guys, Tommy, what was it like for you sitting, waiting for the call to come when it was draft day for you? Oh, I think most players tend to rate themselves a little bit higher than the, the various rating systems that are around this country. Uh, I thought that I would be a first-round draft choice. I thought I would go somewhere low in the first round. By the time the first two rounds went by, I found myself being a little bit upset because that translated into lost dollars. I think that's why most ball players get upset. But the fact is, if you go in those first three or four rounds, you're going to get a real good look from the coaches, and you just make the best. Of I was very nervous, but... Uh, a little bit angry. Joe, what about yourself? Waiting for the call, and of course you have an interesting story on that. Well, it was terribly frustrating. I, what really happened, and Tommy brings up an interesting point, you sometimes rate yourself higher than you actually have other people view you. My problem was, is I had a lot of different people, a lot of different scouts, a lot of different teams come up and say, if you're still around in the first round, we're going to draft you. Well, I was around in the first round. I was around in the second round. I was around in the third round. Finally, midway through the third round, I said, the heck with it, I'm going to play basketball. Right. I, they called me off the basketball court to come tell me Miami drafted me. I was very disappointed. All right, so as the players wait, we'll be checked back with Thurman Thomas and see who's going to go play basketball. And some guys are going to get selected today to be football players. We'll be back in New York as the Packers are next up with the seventh overall pick.
Saying goodbye to a car you've owned for years is a lot like saying goodbye to an old friend. But if it's a Mercedes-Benz, there's always this cheering fact to consider. Over the years, Mercedes-Benz automobiles as a line have retained a higher percentage of their original value than any other make of car sold in America. And that can make the sorrow of parting a little sweeter. I've devised my own way to cook perfect steaks without slicing them open. I uh, cook an extra little piece, and I test it. No one ever knows. Because I eat the evidence. Beef. Real food for real people. The new Black & Decker push-button weed trimmer versus this conventional trimmer. Only Black & Decker has a push-button that lets out line for continuous cutting. No bumping. While the conventional trimmer makes a better sweater, Black & Decker makes an easier-to-use trimmer. This Louisiana lefty has 11 career no-hitters before the end of his junior year in high school. I'm Chris Fallon. The story of Rusty Rugg on this week's Scholastic Sports America, Wednesday on ESPN. Green Bay Packers are next up as we're back live in New York now. There is a question with the new coach, Lindy Infani. And you know that Lindy is an offensive-minded guy. Uh, does he go for a tight end like Keith Jackson? Some feel that that would be a reach with the seventh pick of the draft that he does not rate that high on the board. But I wonder, with no quarterbacks that really are deep throwers, with Wright and Mikowski, they all wear number five, uh, and, and Bosco, um, and no backs that are great receivers out of the backfield, Zim, that with Jackson uh, head and shoulders above everybody else at a tight end, isn't this a good pick for them? No, because I want Buddy Ryan to get him, because that's the way I picked it in the paper. Oh, okay. <laughs> but uh, I, th I think they wanted defense. Uh, the top three are gone. They, they would have taken any one of the top three. They said now they might trade down. But I don't think they expected Sterling Sharp to be here. So right now, at this point, I'd say Sterling Sharp or Michael Urban, wide even, receivers. Even though their receivers are pretty good, they're not in that class, where they have Stanley and Epps, and uh, they right. have some good receivers. Exceptional talent. You know, people waiting, waiting, waiting because there's so many wide receivers and some of them have to start disappearing, Timmy Brown now. But, uh, and this is, uh, granted, again, keep in mind, this is my first year doing this, the jack rating system. But I, I look for them, <laughs> but I look for them to, to maybe go for somebody on a defensive line, if they can get a good defensive lineman, a, uh, a stub, someone of that nature. But not this high. I yeah, maybe not, high maybe not right now, but yeah, or a wide receiver. With those two guys left, uh, with Sharp and Urban, maybe that's where they go. We'll check with the big board and see if they go for the... We'll get it officially done on the draft now, okay, guys? Best player available. Mark it down. 1248. <laughs> Who is it? Hob and Mel? All right. It was early, but he got it in. Best athlete available. This is the big board with the top 40 that Mel Kuyper has put together with his grades. The big board on Wall Street, sometimes you get that herd mentality. Somebody starts selling. We saw what happened last October 19th on Black Monday. You see it on draft day. Something happens, the run starts. Does Tim Brown's selection start the run on wide receivers and still make the Rams want to move up from 14 to 10? Well, or has any log jam been broken here? Well, we talk about all the needs of these teams. We talk about two or three major teams for each club, Bob. And when you talk about the wide receivers, a Sharp and an Irvin, two franchise guys, now do a team like the Jets, who obviously need offensive line help. You see a caddy and you see a Randall McDaniel sitting there as well, two outstanding players. Do they say, okay, let's match up Urban with Toon or Sharp with Toon, and let's have that dynamite combination to provide O'Brien with two outstanding targets rather than go for those two offensive linemen, either Cadigan or McDaniel? That's the interesting thing with the Jets. An underrated player on the line. Nobody seems to mention, you know, Eric Moore's name. Yeah. You know, he seems to go unnoticed. Everybody feels like, you know, Kevin Allen was a bust with, from Indiana. He wore number 75 as well. You look at uh, Eric uh, Moore. Eric Moore is a quality bookend offensive tackle. This guy can be at that left tackle position and stay there for 10 to 12 years and be a pro bowler. All right, let's zero in on the Green Bay Packers. They have just under seven minutes now to make their selection in the first round. It'll be the seventh overall selection. And uh, that's not the selection being announced at this point. Tom Brotz, player personnel recovering from a heart attack. You look back, they took Grant Fullwood last year. That was the first time in five years, in six years actually, that the Packers had gone for a so-called skilled position. I know Paul Zimmerman doesn't like like me not referring to offensive linemen a skill position certainly we're talking the wide receivers tight ends quarterbacks so they had not done well they also have not done well historically the Packers in the common draft with their number one selections you look back at their number ones in the common draft they've only drafted two pro bowlers early on they've got some specific needs let me pin you down 
get your tarot cards out. Who do you, where, do you, where are they going with this? Well, I think defense is their key need. But if you look at the board right now, you don't see any defensive no. linemen that would be worthy of that pick. No defensive backs. You look over to offense, and I think when you see a pass rush, you can't go in that direction unless you reach for a player. So I think that would be a mistake at this point. You go for, although one player moving way up is Aaron Jones from Eastern Kentucky. His workouts have been unbelievable. He's up to 260 now. He's been running in the 4.7s, doing bench pressing with 225, 28 times. Uh, Aaron Jones is a player worth watching at any point in this first round. Uh, defensive backfield help's not going to happen. Top-notch quarterback, no. Pass receiving tight end is Jackson. But I think what uh, Chris Berman and the crew over there alluded to was the fact that when you come back and you have a Frankie Neal and a Walters family, there's no franchise receiver there. So that gets back to Sharp and Irvin. That's why I think there's no question here that you have to go Sharp, Irvin, or Brown. I think they're the three best players on the board right now. Of course, Brown and Jackson. Jackson, Sharp, and Irvin right now are the three best players on the board. So we are seeing it so graphically illustrated, that classic debate each year. Do you draft for a need? Do you draft uh, for best athlete available? You've got to go for best athlete available. And of course, as we look down towards what's going to be happening once this draft is in the book, towards uh, training camp. Are we going to have protracted holdout once again? We've already talked about now with five minutes remaining in the Green Bay selection. Uh, the value of a contract. Andre Bruce on paper, $4.1 million. The people that are negotiating for Neil Smith are running up against the negotiating posture with the Kansas City Chiefs. They're applying the Chiefs are assuming a 10% inflation figure, which will take that value with the deferral money into the 1990s down to $3 million. There's a hard line out there. You know, you talk about the possibility of an impasse being imposed by the federal judge in Minneapolis and then possibly a pay scale coming down from the management side. There is, is there not right now, a de facto and in fact pay scale. You can look at what's happened over the last four or five years years you know what you're going to make based on where you're it, it's just a fact of life you just get slotted in that position and i think uh, you know the people realize that uh, exactly what they can determine as far as dollars and cents of course unless you're that franchise quarterback unless you have a you know three or four in the first round this year we don't have any legitimate franchise quarterbacks or franchise running backs so right. yeah it will be a slotted type situation again probably bob all right the raiders have selected tim brown Less than four minutes to go for Green Bay. Doesn't look like that Raiders skins trade is going to happen at least now at this point. Packers are up and we're back to New York City in round one in New York after this. Today you need an insurance company that looks out for you year after year. A company with experience measured in centuries instead of years. A company with a firm financial footing. You need the Hartford, the insurance people of ITT. When you need us most, we're at our best. That's the Hartford difference. The NFL experience. It's pure excitement. The sights and the sound. The awesome power. The incredible move, the color, the pageantry, the full experience. You get it firsthand when you're there. As a season ticket holder, you'll be where the action is. From the opening kickoff to the tense final moments of the season, you'll see the games and the stars you want to see. You'll be part of the excitement, not just watching NFL football, but living it. But act fast. Order season tickets now for your team. For some NFL teams, they're already gone. Call this number and we'll rush details on seating selection. Make sure you've got a seat for the season. Call 1-800-453-7200 for the NFL experience. This is the leading edge of racing technology. The perfection of the new Pennzoil Z7 Special, powered by the Penske Chevrolet engine. And from day one, it has run on the world-class protection of Pennzoil motor oil. There is no other engine in the world like it, and no other oil in the world can protect it like Pennzoil. Pennzoil, world-class protection that exceeds U.S. warranty requirements of every car maker in the world. Now save $3 a case or $0.20 cents a quart. See mail-in rebate coupon in the back of every bottle. <laughs> 